What's up? Welcome in to Pod Like a Champion, the blueandgold.com recruiting podcast. I'm Patrick Engel, joined by our recruiting insider, Mike Singer. It's Tuesday, September 29th, 2020, and Notre Dame has pulled off the rare recommitment feat. Deion Colsey, four-star wide receiver out of Athens, Georgia, right in SEC territory, is a Notre Dame commit once again. Mike, why don't you tell us how this came together and and really what led Dion to hopping back in the Irish's 2021 class? It was a wild ride um, for, for this recruiting process. So I, I don't know if you can talk about Dion's recruitment without discussing his mother, Yolanda Jackson, because she um, tells a has a pretty interesting side of it and, and tells a really good story. So make sure to go to blueandgold.com. The story is inside Dion Colsey's Notre Dame recommitment. Um, so I think sh- the first time he committed was October of 2019. This, again, this is Dion Colsey, um, 6'4", 200-pound receiver, ranked as the number 107 player nationally, number 17 receiver um, in America. So his mom, big Notre Dame fan, I think she kind of had a sizable – um, played a sizable part in his commitment to Notre Dame October 2019. Told Brian Kelly of his commitment just hours before the USC game last fall. And then process kind of wears on. He went to he went back to Notre Dame in December, had a good visit there by all accounts. But then I believe it was January, uh, or late January or, or somewhere, January, February time frame, he went to Georgia on a visit that no one even knew about. That, that was pretty much off the radar until he decommitted in uh, late March. Told Rivals.com's Chad Simmons, I feel like I rushed my decision, want to take a step back, take my visits, um, that whole process. Well, the second time around, his mom really gave Dion the full reins of his recruitment. She felt that she, they, her and her husband, Frank, needed to take a step back. Not that they were overbearing the first time around, but that – look, this is your decision. We don't want what we think to play a major role in this. We want it to be all on you, Dion. So um, Dion really shut down doing interviews unless you would go out to see him in person, which I did in July. Uh, So that like April, May, June, July period, everyone was pretty much in the dark. And I would even say some of the coaches were in the dark too. Um, there were times where Dion was not very responsive to Notre Dame. And at the time, when you hear that from various sources, it's kind of like, all right, Notre Dame's fading. And when I went to see him in July, as I mentioned, thought, yeah, I left there thinking, I don't know if he's going to Notre Dame. Well, it turns out he's pretty much like that with every coaching staff. Dion was, you know, he opened his recruiting process back up to, uh, you know, slow it down, go through it, take all his visits. Well, Pandemic happens, right? Can't take visits. Um, it's all just coaches hitting you up and the Zoom calls and the texting. He got sick of it pretty quick. I was when you hear about you know how tired he got of the recruiting process. I'm, I'm shocked he even lasted uh, until September. Um, so there was a shift in August where he was kind of like, all right, I'm going to figure out where I'm going to go, um, and why not Notre Dame? Like, wh- why did I even decommit in the first? place maybe not that he regretted decommitting but uh, that he, he certainly second guessed like it, it is the original decision to decommit because obviously he ended up back in Notre Dame's class picked them on Monday and again kind of an epiphany of sorts in August where Notre Dame really started to trend back for him and uh, I don't know if there was anything even that Notre Dame did all that fantastic to woo him back in uh, obviously they kept on them. They outlasted these other schools, but it was just Dion thinking like, all right, it's the academics. It's what the school can offer me on and off the field. Um, so that it, it was a fascinating recruitment to cover. Um, and I, I love going out there to cover Dion Colsey. Um, great kid. Um, you know, Athens is just an hour and a half, two hours from me here in Atlanta. So I've gone out to see him four or five times. Um, as many times as Dion's been to Notre Dame, I've been out to see Dion. Completely random, not even important little nugget there. But um, 
Yeah, so that's kind of how his recruitment came together. It was it was wild, had twists and turns, but uh, I mean, maybe it wasn't it wasn't some crazy, you know, like SEC recruitment where you know he's, he kids turned down money from this school to go to the schools. <laughs> it was nothing, nothing like that kind of crazy. I think when I say crazy recruitment, that's what people are thinking. Uh, but it was just kind of one of those where it was just really tough to read as a reporter um, until kind of late August, early September really started to take shape that, all right, yeah, it's going back to Notre Dame. So there you go. The extended cliff notes on how Dean Colsey got back in Notre Dame's class. For those of you guys wondering just about recommitments in general, it's the fourth one uh, for Notre Dame, at least when we gathered in the Brian Kelly era, the other three, Braden Lindsay, Receiver in the 2018 class, Stefan Tuitt, defensive end, 2011. Aaron Lynch, defensive end, 2011. Bonus points, Mike, if you can name which schools they flipped to, only to spurn once again for Notre Dame. I would only know I would only know Lindsay with Oregon. I wouldn't know the others. Yes, Stefan Tuitt, Georgia Tech, Aaron Lynch, Florida State. So we'll dive back into to Colsey a little bit here, but first. Please rate, view, subscribe to the podcast. We'll love you even more if you leave us five stars and nice comments if you like what you hear. Best way to support this podcast is to subscribe to blueandgold.com. You can also follow us on Twitter. You can follow Mike at rivals underscore singer, and you can follow me at Patrick Engel underscore. That's E-N-G-E-L. So, Dion Colsey. I'm going to really, this is you. I'm going to interrupt you. So, you mentioned Aaron Lynch. All right. He ended up playing for USF. University of South Florida. All right. Um, Patrick and I decided, all right, this is X time we're going to record today. Um, and it was like two minutes. And I was like, oh, crap. So I, I just had to throw on something real quick. I apologize for our video audience. I usually like to wear at least a nice t shirt. Yeah. Our podcast audience, you know, this doesn't make no anyone care. For you, but <laughs> for currently wearing a USF Bulls hoodie. I tried to keep it kind of low key that I was a USF grad until after the game, but I guess it's kind of out there now. But hey. repping the, the alma mater, never, never forgetting the, the school colors here. You want, no, I want to know one thing about Mike. He bleeds that dark green and gold. Is that is what do they even call the colors? I mean, let's let us see. Is there an official thing? Like, is, I, is it a certain shade of green that you dare I not don't. mess up, or someone will jump on you in Raymond Jane Stadium? You know, I, I went. I, I covered USF even before I started going to USF. I did the two year community college route and then went to USF St. Petersburg. So I didn't even go to the main Tampa campus. So I'm, I graduated from USF, but not really. It's kind of kind of one of those deals. Another note, if you are on our YouTube audience to see this panorama behind me, um, if you want to buy your own copy of this, this is awesome. Renovated 2017 Notre Dame Stadium. We got the link in the description of this video. If you're on podcast form, go to bluegoldonline.com and uh, you can check out the uh, Notre Dame Stadium panorama and you can buy a copy yourself. All right. So let's get back on the on-ramp here. Dion Colsey, and and really what this stood out uh, to me here is sometimes you just kind of have to be the last one standing, right? I mean, it's I don't tortoise and hare. I mean, I don't know if that's the right analogy or or not, but it, you you get the idea. Sometimes you just win these recruitments by just outlasting some of these other teams, and I think we saw that with Georgia in particular. Once uh, Dion decommitted. Uh, of course, you later learn, like you said, that he visited Georgia. And at that point, it becomes a thing of, all right, he's from Athens, Georgia. Uh, it's the hometown school. We want to be close to mom, yada, yada, all, all of that you know, typical stuff that, that kind of had him leaning that way. But it it, it never worked out. And you, there's a million different ways that you could ask, depending on which message board you consult or person you ask or, or whatever that for all we really know and don't want to dive into one of them, sure various versions out there somewhere on these recruiting interwebs of uh, who cooled on who, what happened, the, you know, the, we didn't, we didn't want him anyway crowd. I'm sure is out <laughs> full force in, in at least in, in Georgia. And, and maybe that's true. I, I, I don't know, but what, whatever it is, is he had opportunities to be in, in Georgia's class. It, it didn't work. And, and that's not to say anyone screwed anything up or made a wrong decision there or anything, but 
when you're just trying to evaluate, oh, did they beat Georgia, blah, 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 or how can you call this a recruiting win over this school versus not that one? It, it, it doesn't matter. Like, okay, either way, there were opportunities. He didn't take them. That's – those were his choices. There were Georgia's choices, a combination of both, or how much, I, I don't know. But nonetheless, ended up being the final three of Florida, Tennessee, and Notre Dame. And really, it sounds like having to do with that outlasting part is – that seed that his that his mom planted about what she liked about Notre Dame never really left his mind, and and certainly even as maybe even though he wasn't talking to them regularly, like you said, Mike, at least Notre Dame staff was in communication in the right type that it wasn't like a thing where he thought I don't have the opportunity to go here if I want to, and obviously at some point he decided he wanted to do that again. So that's my at least read on it of no point in did not staying in communication with a, a kid that you think can be a difference maker. Of course, uh, it seems pretty clear Colsey can be and doing it for the sake that you just never know what happens three months from a certain time when you feel like you're not in the race. Patrick, I completely agree with everything you just said. I, I made a comment. Someone asked me about, did Georgia cool on them? It was on our Rockneys Roundtable message board at blueandgold.com. And Patrick, I saw you liked it today. So you, some of what you just said is from that post. It was, it was almost verbatim. No, um, these are still some of my original thoughts. Uh, Give me some credit uh, here. Uh, Give me I'm, some credit. I, I, this I is, said this it, is just I, in general how a lot of these play out. But nonetheless, uh, continue. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like, and, and I was asked on WSBT radio, Darren Pritchard, he asked me the same question yesterday, did Georgia cool on them? And I kind of went on a tirade. I don't even know if it all made sense, but. <laughs> when do your tirades ever make sense? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who cooled on it? It's, it's, this, this was what I, what I told Darren. It's like, if I ask a girl out, and of course I wouldn't do that because I'm married, but before I was married, if I asked a girl out, I said, hey, you want to go on a date with me? She said, no. And then I say, well, I didn't want you anyways. <laughs> who cooled on who, right? So like I said earlier, Dion w wasn't all that receptive in Notre Dame, but it was this kind of the same. Like he just was over the recruiting process. So he wasn't texting a lot of coaches back. That's kind of what I picked up on. So who's to say that Georgia wasn't like, man, Colsey's not texting us back. We well, let's see if this kid wants it. And then they get the other kid. Cause that actually, they actually did get another receiver commitment. Uh, I want to say a month ago. So here's, here's what it really boils down to. If Dion Colsey wanted to go to Georgia, he would be committed to Georgia right now. He had ample opportunity. Go look at his rivals.com profile. I'm going to pull it up. Okay. There were a dozen picks for him to go to Georgia, including me, because mine was in for Notre Dame. Then he decommitted and for whatever reason, the rivals future cast uh, admin or whatever it is, if a kid decommits, your future cast is still in for that school that you originally had it in for. So I had it in for Notre Dame. Well, I had to change it because at that point, I didn't think he was going to Notre Dame after he decommitted. So I put it in for Georgia. Kind of everyone seemed to think it was going to Georgia. I thought it made sense. All these kids early in the pandemic are just going to the local school. It made sense. Um, Chad Simmons, who's as tied in as anybody in the state of Georgia, he put one in for Georgia as well. So it just, again, it made a, a ton of sense there. So he would have gone to Georgia if he wanted to go to Georgia, people. So the whole cool thing is just silly because uh, all, all these schools, I mean, there, there were committable offers uh, at one point or the other. Maybe the Georgia one two days before he announced his commitment to Notre Dame. Maybe Georgia wasn't committable at that point. Well, yeah, no crap because they knew he was going to Notre Dame, so they're going to pull his offer. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's not that difficult to figure out. but. That's my tirade, Patrick. Do you have any follow-up comments? No, I mean, you can I just – I can go on more of a tirade. <laughs> you can spin these things in, in millions of different ways depending on – Do you on want to know who doesn't care? Do. Notre Dame doesn't no. – Two craps. Who cooled on Deion Colsey? Because they got Notre, that kid they wanted. They got, they got the kid. They don't care if Deion Colsey has 45 offers or two offers. Of course, maybe – if you're going to have a selection, maybe have 
I'll, I'll, I'll pick the kid with 45 offers and higher ranking just from an optics standpoint. But I'm telling you, Notre Dame does not care if the kid's ranked a five-star or three-star. They would rather take a kid they think is a three-star – or I'm sorry, they'll rather take a kid who's ranked as a four star, let's say, but is ranked as a three than vice versa. If they, you know, if Rivals thinks this kid's great, but the Notre Dame doesn't, they're not going to be like, well, Rivals thinks he's great, so let, let's take him. Um, if they think the kid's great, Rivals doesn't. Oh well, or, or you know, that that's just what it boils down to. Yeah, and ultimately, it's like Notre Dame thought the kid's a game changer. They got him. Who cares? You know, I, I can't even believe this is a discussion. I, I can't believe we're talking about this. I mean, this is the kids' offer list. Alabama, Auburn, Florida, Florida State, Georgia, Michigan, Oregon, Penn State, Tennessee. I skipped over other Power 5 schools, too. I, I mean, it, it's it, – I, I, Deion Colsey's back in the class, and we're still fielding questions about, well, did these schools even want them that it offered them? I mean, come freaking on. Dion Colsey, people. Come on. <laughs> All right. I think we've said what we need to say there. Let's move on. Mike, another receiver from the Atlanta area. The Notre Dame is just recruiting all these kids just because they want to make your job as easy as possible. Is I love it. going to announce his commitment on Friday, October 2nd. We're going to get into that next. And then we're going to get into having our, our special guest here on the podcast, Mark Spindler father of Notre Dame commit Rocco Spindler. But first, I'm so we're going to take a quick break. Jaden Thomas, a four-star receiver from Atlanta's Pace Academy, making his college announcement on Friday, October 2nd. Mike, you have your future cast pick in for Notre Dame. Uh, Thomas, longtime Notre Dame target. Uh, my initial thought was when he made the announcement saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to commit then, was that it was – Good news for Notre Dame. It sounds like you have no reason to change a commitment or your forecast. What do we got to know here about the seemingly good chances of Notre Dame grabbing its second Georgia receiver this week? Yeah, I, I feel really confident about Notre Dame's chances here, but I, I, I just want to throw out the preface of you just never know with recruiting. I, I – I try not to be surprised by recruiting, though. Sometimes things certainly surprise me. But if you just have the expectations of who freaking knows, then, then sometimes you're better off. But with, with that being said, really confident with, with Notre Dame's chances with Jaden Thomas. Um, I put my pick in August 10th. Um, so I've been feeling pretty good about it for uh, almost two months. I don't – think it's a whole lot of coincidence that Jaden Thomas tweeted out, hey, I'm announcing this Friday about five or ten minutes after Colsey announced his commitment to Notre Dame. Like, is it, if that was a coincidence, then um, that's, that's an interesting one. So um, I, I've been to Pace Academy several times um, since January to go and interview um, Thomas. It's like 40 minutes from my house, so – Instead of calling this kid up on the phone all the time, I'd rather just go see him in person. Pace Academy, you walk into it, you're like, is this Hogwarts? Like, it, it's, it's such a cool-looking school. Um, he, he toured me through there in January, February, and so I got to see the – it's just – it's a beautiful private school. Um, and, and talking to Jaden, he's told me it's like – I mean, this is like a mini Notre Dame. It, it, the transition from Pace to Notre Dame would be pretty seamless. This is a high academic kid, super smart kid um, on, the, on the field as well. Um, you can see it when he's playing, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, his final five list of schools is Arkansas, Georgia, Michigan, Notre Dame, Penn State. Um, but in, honest, in all honesty, it seems like it's Notre Dame blank and then other schools like uh, uh, maybe Michigan's made a late run at them since they had a ride receiver decommitment um, but and, and Marcus Allen from Ohio but honestly um, you know it, it seems to be all Notre Dame and of course same discussion of oh the, the other schools cool off yeah probably cooled off because they figured he's going to Notre Dame so let's put our resources elsewhere um, uh, but yeah again future cast is in for Notre Dame don't plan on moving it 
So you've seen both him and Colsey here in the last couple of weeks. Again, Notre Dame just making your job so easy by recruiting so Georgia easy. as much as it has. What are your thoughts on, on what you saw out of both? And it really the, the player Notre Dame is getting in Colsey and could possibly get in Jaden Thomas if he announces for them this Friday. All right, I played wide receiver in high school. You wouldn't think it if you saw me today, but I, I played wide receiver in high school, so that's the one position I feel like I know the most about. Um, so I'll let's just assume Thomas is picking Notre Dame, and then let's throw in Lorenzo Styles, Notre Dame's first receiver commitment. Um, so you have Styles, who is the – I mean, none of these guys are short. I mean, Styles, I believe, is listed at 6'1", 170. So, um, and I've stood next to him, and he's – about an inch shorter than me and I'm about six two. So I, I would assume that that listed height is accurate. A lot of times they're not, but I believe that one is. He's the shiftier, more dynamic athlete with the ball in his hands. A lot of people talk to me about, honestly, when I say a lot, it, it seems every day I'm being asked, should Styles play corner if we get this guy, this guy, you know, should move Styles corner? All I know is Notre Dame's recruiting as a wide receiver, so that's what I'm going to go with. He is that just electric playmaker with the ball in his hands. He had a 50-yard punt return um, this past week. He's had a jet sweep uh, goal line touchdown the week before. It's just he's that guy, get the ball in his hands, put him in the slot, put him out to the field, just let him go to work. So that's Lorenzo Styles. Well, Dion is a big 6'4", 200, 205-pounder. Uh, maybe I, I believe he's actually – He's listed at 205. I believe he's slimmed down to maybe 10 or 195. So he's he's still in that big bodied wide receiver ballpark. So I went and saw him uh what was that September 18th and he caught seven passes, 141 yards in a touchdown. Boundary guy, single coverage, get him the football. Not that difficult. I couldn't believe that the other team who had a wide receiver about five foot six or seven was leaving him single coverage um, that DC probably should, you know, someone should sit down. <laughs> think life him. choices. Yes. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to throw out the, they should get fired, but that, that, that's too much. But yeah, you need to be sat down and be like, what are you doing? Like Bill Belichick, one Oh one take away the best teams player and, and then go from there. Anyway. So they, they did not do that with Colsey. They, let them left them on an island and and Colsey just torches them. He's the, again that there's that saying all the time. Oh, that 50 50 ball is is actually 90 10 with a player like this. It, it, you know, it's it's kind of true at the high school level, at least. We'll see what he gets to college, but that is Deion Colsey. He is in the mold of Chase Claypool and Miles Boykin. He is going to continue that tradition of big body wide receivers um, in the boundary. And then you have Jaden Thomas, 6'2", 205. So he's still a big kid. Um, you talk about just physically, he looks strong, and he's got good height as well. He's kind of a mix of styles in Colsey that you can have him as that big boundary receiver, but he's also really good out in the field as well. And when I saw him play September 25th, so just this past Friday, had about five receptions for 70 yards, um, you, you often don't see a wide receiver like calling out things in the defense, like making different checks, like, hey, you guys need to watch this. And um, that just showed his leadership skills to me and that showed um, just how uh, smart he is as a football player. Um, he, he's kind of that in between those two, um, maybe a little bit of a lower ceiling than Styles and Colsey. Um, but his floor is pretty high as well in that I don't think there's a ton of bust potential with him. I think um, at, at worst he moves over to defense. And he could be a pretty um, solid rangy safety. So um, I, I like all three of these wide receivers. Um, you know, you're, you're splitting hairs trying to figure out who's the best one. They just all have different skill sets. I think Thomas is the best route runner. Um, Colsey has the best ball skills. Um, in terms of like going up and getting the ball, and then Styles is the best with the ball in his hands. So let's say again, assume for a second, Notre Dame lands Jaden Thomas. That would be three receivers from the 2021 Rivals 250 that are in the class. Pretty good, right? Yeah. You know who else has? 
can can boast that. There's only a handful of others. I think it's five. Yeah, Dante Thornton. It's still theoretically out there. And of course, this is, you know, we're talking about this in September. Things can change, but doesn't change that this is the company you want to be in. Yeah, absolutely. Alabama, Oklahoma, Oregon, Florida, Clemson. Those are the five that have three receivers of the receivers in their rivals 250. Oh, LSU, sorry, that's in there too. Uh, committed. So that's six in addition to Notre Dame. That's where you want to be, right? Yeah. I mean, that's where you want to be recruiting with if you're thinking thinking big. So you've you've got to like how that part of the class has come together and how the skill positions have, have rounded into this. Yeah, absolutely. And Notre Dame would be more than happy just to sign these three guys out wide receiver, but they're not going to stop recruiting Dante Thornton from Baltimore, Maryland, Mount St. Joseph High School. Uh, you know, he's a top – right around top 50 player nationally per rivals and uh, another one of those big uh, boundary guys just to get the ball up to him. He He's a, a borderline five-star talent, if not a five-star talent, in my opinion. He's a, he's a really big-time player. So Notre Dame is still in the mix for him. You know, I, I don't know if they're going to end up landing. It's gonna be, he seems really enamored with, with Oregon and some of these schools out west, but um, hey, at least he visited Notre Dame about two years ago, so they got that going for him. Uh, of course, the dead period extended through the rest of this year, so I don't. It, the only re, the way he he or any other prospects are going to go out to Notre Dame this fall, um, uh, before January 2021, is just go walk around campus, which some recruits have absolutely done. Uh, but I just don't know if Thornton's going to be do that, and so we'll, we'll see on Thornton. But um, it, you couple the 2021 hall with 2020 yeah j uh um, jordan johnson five-star wide receiver from st louis that's not bad uh xavier watts he's ranked as a three-star but some sites has him as a four-star and you watch his tape he's an impressive impressive player you got jay brunel who just all he did was set the central massachusetts career record for receiving yards with, with almost three thousand. he's just a baller as well so you gotta be feeling pretty good if you're Dell Alexander. Uh, I would, I would definitely think so. Where he's got himself a pretty good crop of receivers. It's, it can match a lot of Notre Dame's recent classes. So we're gonna get to our guest, who I'm sure you've been waiting for, Mark Splint Spindler, uh, Rocco Spindler's dad. Of course, I'm sure you all know who Rocco Spindler is after investing so much time and energy into that recruitment. So. We're going to get to Mark. We're going to take a break here first, and then here we'll play our conversation with Mark Spindler. We're joined by Mark Spindler, the father of Notre Dame offensive line commit Rocco Spindler. Mark, how's it going? Thanks for joining us today. I'm doing doing great, fellas. Thanks for uh, inviting me on. So the first thing we we had to ask in in just noticing – where you're from is, is look, screen look at, and from we gotta, just <laughs> looking at the Wikipedia page, right, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, very on brand for, for both of us as uh, fans of the office. And we're curious when people learn that you're from there, how often do they say, Oh, do you like the office or immediately just default to that because they know that's what screen is from. So well, I think it, it all depends on what generation early on when, when there wasn't the office and I was from Scranton, people, you know, was synonymous Scranton with Mark Spiller, and now it's Scranton with the office. So I guess it all depends on which generation that you're talking to. But more often than not, a lot of people, when the office was kind of crushing it, uh, you know, it, it became pretty synonymous with Scranton, the office, the office, Scranton. And the funny thing is, I, I don't believe the office is in, there's, has no, I don't even think they ever even filmed it in Scranton. Nope. If they you did, said- it was very little. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> you said that when the office was popular, or, I mean, was is past tense, Mark. I mean, this thing is bigger than ever. Um, yeah. I mean, do, do you and your kids watch The Office? Well, I, I can tell you, my, my oldest daughter, Gabriella, who, who got me, I, I, that's the, the, the office is with the dude Steve Corral, right? Is, is yeah, he, that's so, right. So, so I, I wasn't really big into that. But once I found out who he was, now that dude is serious funny, bro. I mean, he is, the whole thing is kind of just, it's kind of funny just in a different way. I guess that's what makes it funny, right? I mean, it's, 
realistic in one sense, but do I watch it every week? No. Does my daughter Gabrielle? I mean, she just looks at the guy and laughs, and you know, <laughs> I can understand why. Well, Mark, we'll, we'll talk actual business with you here. Uh, obviously, you were a big-time recruit in your own right, I believe. Uh, USA Today All-American in 1986 and um, that's when, when if you're on that USA Today high school All-American list back then I mean it, it's still big now but that was kind of the gold standard for were you a big time recruit that's way before all the recruiting services and all that good stuff um, so Mark you know the recruiting process you went through it obviously played at Pitt before eight year career in the NFL how much would you say is the recruiting process changed uh, nine years that's that's a miscount on my part. How would you say the recruiting process has changed from uh, your time and then going through it with Rocco, your son? Well, really just, I mean, there's a lot of different aspects, but from the technological aspect of it, the touchability, to be able to get in touch with someone, um, you know, why I felt like, you know, and like you did, I mean, if you were on that USA Today team, you were pretty good. What was really appreciative now looking back on it is the hard work and the effort that, you know, the, the coaches as well as the reporters had to go through to just get information that they can use, right? Viable information to take a plane ride or a trip to see someone where the difference is today, obviously you have huddle, uh, you have camps. I mean, everything digitally today um, has changed not only the world, but changed the recruiting process. I would say that is probably the biggest single difference, the ability to be able to communicate with one touch, whether it's a text, email, Twitter, you know, I mean, these kids have all these different, you know, for me, back then, there was one hard line phone, which you guys, da, 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 da. And, and there was a busy signal on the other end. That was the way to get away from coaches. So let's just say when Joe Paterno would call on a telephone and he'd occupy your time for an hour, you didn't really have to deal with any other coach at that time. And so now I've watched Rocco through the recruiting process. He's on a, he's on a call with someone, whether it's you know FaceTime or Zoom, and, and there's just constant text messages coming in that you have to wipe away. So you know, to be able to run, you can run, but you can't hide in 2020 when it comes to recruiting. Now, when Joe Paterno is on the phone with you for an hour, do you think that's a calculated move by his part to say, hey, if I'm on the phone with him, no one else can be? No doubt. I think that's, I, I think that was a very smart move by a lot of people. I mean, we couldn't afford the double line back then. And I think at the end, you know, when other coaches started to say, listen, we, we've noticed, you know, the phone between six and 10 at night is busy. I think my dad went out and he invested into the double line where you'd click over and then you'd be on with, you know, either Hayden Fry or Bo or, you know, whoever it was. But, you know, there's just, I mean, just so many differences today. A lot of similarities. Look, you still have to line up. You still have to play, right? I, I don't think coaches are going to just go off of what publications and recruiting services have to say because you have to sign on the dotted line for, for that person once you offer them and once they become part of your program. So you have to, you know, for me, it would be, I want to be able to use these as tools, but, but I, I still think there should be some more old school of watching how, how that translates onto the football field with the eyeball test and not through, you know, film. And I don't think that's done often enough. Um, but nonetheless, there's some similarities, but really, the digital technological era has changed recruiting, you know, from now in foreseeable future. And of course, in the past, I guess now it's been uh, seven months since you can't even do in-person recruiting anymore. And Rocco was making his decision and having that, you know, affect his timeline for the first five or so months of that. How did that just even more of a reliance on needing to only electronically communicate and uh, finish off the recruitment through that process kind of change things for, for Rocco, but also still kind of maybe not hurt him as much just because he'd been to the, all of the finalists before had been to Notre Dame and Michigan before in person had met the staff, had known those guys for, for multiple years. Yeah. We got a little, we got a little lucky as you know, he got into the recruiting game early, obviously, you know, some, some recruits start, they, they get recruited early. Some kids just bust on their senior year. For those individuals, I have to think it's just a tremendous challenge. But, um, 
you know, once again, that was a viable tool. Rocco had a plan, um, unfortunately got disrupted. The plan was very clear. The player was, you know, the plan was concise. Um, and the plan was very committed. And unfortunately, it got interrupted by life, something much more important than the recruiting system in itself. Having that opportunity to be able to be in the recruiting game early, it was advantageous because at the end, when you had a switch to really Zoom calls and, and, and virtual tours of universities, if you didn't have a decent understanding of, of where you wanted to go, why you were going to go there, what you were looking for, I can see it's a very uh, difficult challenge for those individuals who are being recruited right now in their senior year because there's some players, let's face it, guys, we know bust onto the scene their senior year and get offered to big-time universities that are going to have to make decisions based on what they hear and what they see virtually. You know, that's, that's not the best scenario, but it's better than not having, you know, any scenario. Like a good problem to have, right? Yeah. I, once, once you're saying that, Mark, there's two guys I can immediately think of off the top of my head that even Notre Dame's recruiting. Um, here's a simple but very complicated question, Mark, that we could spend a lot of time on. How did Rocco's commitment to Notre Dame, Notre Dame really come together? Um, it was pretty simple. I mean, you know, early in, in, in the process, when you want to try to identify, you know, the, the schools that really you feel are a viable path um, to what you're looking for. You know, first and foremost, that's academically. Tradition, a history of great tradition. And what does tradition mean? It's just not being a Miami Hurricane team of the 80s, 90s. I'm talking about tradition. When you just mention the name, you know, rich in history, right? Head coaches, successes, those type of things. And then having the ability to be able to get this great education and put you in a national football league. There's only so many of those schools that are out there. Notre Dame being one of them and being at the top. You throw in the fact I was recruited by Notre Dame. Um, it kind of didn't work out for me. You know, they were always at the top of the list. My father, obviously, was always a big Notre Dame fan. You know, he, he didn't really go out of his way when I was being recruited to say, this is the school that you should go to. But clearly it was down to Penn State, Notre Dame, and Pitt, right? And, and he let me make that decision. And he never said until afterwards, once I got into the National Football League several years in, that I made the biggest mistake and how dumb I was. But he used probably much nastier words than that because that's <laughs> who my dad was. And then when he saw that my son had an opportunity, he started to plant that seed early you know, in his, in his mindset. And, and, and I did as well. I'm like, this is a, this is, you know, I, I didn't do this with my dad, of course, because I grew up once I became a pit man, I mean, a Notre Dame hater. I mean, I could not stand Notre Dame. I mean, you think about some of the losses in just three year period of time, two of them against Notre Dame, the year they won the national championship. I mean, we beat them from one end of the field to the other end of the field. And there was no way they should have won that football game. And, and really, it was the luck of the Irish was on their side. And that phrase in itself made me begin to, like, hate Notre Dame that, look, you can do everything you have to do to beat them. And sooner or later, like, the Yankees, the ghosts will show up and you'll lose that football game. But uh, so the recruiting process with Notre Dame started early, um, especially, you know, when, when you talk about tradition, my dad kind of kind of nurtured it along, wanted to keep it top of the mind. But he, he also – you know, was open to other schools that, that had, you know, great tradition, putting players in the National Football League. But the education part always, for all of us, um, really just kept pointing back to Notre Dame. So how did their, uh, Rocco and his grandfather's relationship really blossom? Like, tell us about their uh, relationship that really, what you said, planted the seed, seemingly a seed that, uh, Rocco took to heart from what he uh, said after initially making his commitment so, announcement. You know, we're a big outdoors family. My dad taught us this at an early age, and my father would make the trek from Michigan. Um, I think this would be his 26, 27 year. And unfortunately, you know, obviously he's not going to make that last year. It was the first one they did. And so, but, but you know, I, I got my children involved in the outdoors. And so their grandfather being eight, nine hours away, 
he always made it a point that when he came here, he wanted to spend as much time with his grandchildren that he could. And having my son in deer camp with him, you know, and shooting his first deer with him and, you know, shaking hands and a cigarette hanging out of the mouth and putting blood on the face and those type of things. And having those personal conversations. Obviously, my father was such a big uh, part of my life growing up, at, athletically speaking. And he, you know, always would ask, how's Rocco doing? And he always felt like, you know, I was too soft on him, wasn't driving him hard enough or fast enough. And I said, Dad, look, I'm going to take what you taught me and, uh, and I'm going to tweak it a little bit and do it what, what I think is best. And he would always say, well, son, what I did with you obviously worked. You know, you're one of the best high school football players in America. You know, one of four freshmen ever started University of Pittsburgh. And you went on to play nine years and got paid for the 10th years in the NFL. So let's not, you know, shoot down what I did. So he would always want to be involved in, in, in kind of Rocco's development over the telephone. Let me talk to him on the phone. Let, 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 me, let me have it. And I don't know what they would talk about. But as my dad began to get sick, and obviously you, you, you knew that, you know, time was precious over the last four years. He'd have good days. He'd have bad days. He'd have really good months, bad months. And he had a good year and he had a bad year. And, and so I think, you know, as, as a grandson, you start to recognize this and that bond and that relationship becomes closer as you know he's getting closer to the other end of the spectrum. And, and so, you know, Rocco – wanted to go through a process. And a lot of people here say, you know, I made a promise to my grandfather and today I fulfilled that promise. So when um, I decided for the last time, I said, I better get in the car and I better go see my dad. Things aren't going well, he's in the hospital. I, I just said to my son, I said, hey, you, you wanna go for the ride with me? You know, and I, I did want him to go and I kind of didn't want him to go because you don't want him to see your grandfather in that condition. He's like, no, dad, I wanna go. So we spent the week there and we all got to talk about a lot of different things. And then the last day, I, I, you know, you're looking across and you're, you're like, you know, this is probably going to be the last time I'm going to see my father, right? I mean, it just, I'm hoping for the best, but I just have an inkling that maybe this might, and the next call I get is not going to be a good one. And so I said, you know, Dad, I love you. I got to go. And I got up. I go, let's go somewhere. We're going to drive back. And when I turned back around, he was leaning over the bed and he was whispering into my dad's ear. And I could see my dad shaking his head up and down, yes. I don't know what he told him that day. I don't want to know what he told him that day. And I won't even speculate what I told him that day, okay, what he, what he told him. But what I do know is, is that my dad really had this, this, you know, if he could have it one way, to go to Notre Dame. Rocco needed to go through the process, a sincere process, Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, right? Um, how to go through this and, and, and find out, is Notre Dame the right choice? And I got to tell you, when it came down to it, I didn't think he was going to Notre Dame. I thought he was going to Michigan. His mother thought he was going to Michigan. And, and when he told us, and in the manner in which he told us, he, I, I, you know, and this is, this, you guys are going to get this first. So finally, this was about a week before, and I said, son, listen, let me tell you, I'm coming home from the cabin today, and, and you better let me know where you're going to school, because we're about a week away here, um, and I think me and your mother deserve to know this. And so he's like, all right. So I got home that day, and, and we ate, and I was just sitting there, you know, I had, I was just waiting for the moment. I'm like, don't do it right now. Kind of kind of gracefully go into it, but that's not who I am. So I'm like, all right, son, so where's it going to be? Where are you going? And as he got ready to talk, I said, son, listen, I don't care where you go. You can't make a bad choice. You cannot make a bad choice. And I really sincerely meant this. And he goes, well, dad, mom, I'm going to go to Michigan. That's what he said. And, and I said, hey, congratulations, son. I'm happy for you. Couldn't make a bad choice. It's going to be 45 minutes up the road. He goes, what do you think about that? And I said, son, you know, I said, you really want to know what I think about it? I said, uh, I said, I think it's a great choice. I said, but as I, I go, there's something stuck in my craw about Notre Dame. It might have just been the better opportunity for you. And I no sooner had that out of my mouth, his mother said, 
I agree a hundred percent. I think maybe you know you sold yourself short. I think this and I, we, me and her never really talked about this, but something was stuck in my craw about Notre Dame. And he goes, "Good bitches, because I'm going to Notre Dame." Honest to God. <laughs> and, and so we were like, "Wow, you really, you really." But he wanted to see how we felt. That's how much it felt to him. But. I don't want to discredit Michigan and Jim Harbaugh. Their recruiting coordinator did a great job. Ohio State did a pretty good job, and Penn State did a fantastic job. My son, he handled this very professionally. Um, he went through an entire process, a sincere process. And I can tell you, if a couple of things might have been a little bit different, maybe he's not going to Notre Dame. But everything fell the way that he needed it to fall. It was his decision. And we couldn't be happier to be talking about the Irish. I think I have like 15,000 follow-up questions. Mark, you told me that story on the phone. Maybe I want to say it was like two or three days after Rocco committed. And I was like, we've got to get this story out there for everyone to hear. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yep. Um, as, as far, the people uh, what they want. Absolutely. As far as the timeline goes, so he announced it was August 8th. Um, he, I believe he did the Zoom call with Notre Dame to tell them two weeks before. So when would that have – the conversation where he told you where he was going, where would that have fallen with that time? I think he might have told me about 10 days before. We told Notre Dame maybe a week before. Okay. You know, he told them a week before. Um, you know, shortly after he told us, he called. He, you know, I, I knew for a couple of days. And, and, and so um, I, I think somehow I had a – a conversation with coach Quinn on the phone or something like that. I, I don't even know. I had a question I had to ask him and I already knew that he was probably going there and, you know, the kind of guy that I am, I, I kind of got to keep it a little thick sometimes. And so, you know, I'm like, I'm like, coach, you know, it's, you know, getting down to the final few schools. And he's like, you mean there's more than two? I go, Oh yeah, there's definitely more than two coach. Where you been? And, and then he had this silence, you know, on the other end. And I'm like, you know, you know, so you better make sure, you know, you, you, you push right through the finish line and see where it's at. And I'm sitting there, you know, cause I, now I'm setting, I'm setting up the crescendo for the end, right? I want the big finish. I always want the big finish at the end. And so, you know, he made the zoom call and he already knew how he wanted to go into it. And, you know, he's like, you want to thank you for the opportunity. And really it kind of didn't sound that was going to go their way. And then at the end, he's like, you know, and so if you have like a number 50, I'm coming to school there. They were, they were all very excited. So we were all excited. We we're very excited. This is a really, you know, how could you not be excited for an opportunity to come to a school with such great history, such great tradition, you know, such great ethic. I mean, everything when you talk about them, when you understand it is, is really, it is a special place with hallowed grounds. All right, one more follow-up question, Mark. So you mentioned you thought he was going to Notre – or I'm sorry, you thought he was going to Michigan. Um, why did you kind of think that at – like what was the timeline of when you maybe started to think he was leaning back Notre Dame? Or was it that conversation between um, him and your wife is when like you thought he was Michigan and then, and then obviously at the end of that conversation you thought he was back to Notre Dame? We, we – you know, I, I, I'll be – Guys, listen, I, I can I could swing a jury pool. If they ever put me on one, don't hold it against me, but I, I can swing a jury pool, no problem. And I didn't want to be that guy, especially with this decision, because I didn't want it to come back on me. But I'm going to tell you, Jim Harbaugh, who I have tremendous, tremendous respect for, okay? Matt Dudek, who is their leader, tremendous respect for. They did a very sincere, fantastic job and they wanted Rocco every bit as much as Notre Dame and maybe even more so. And, and, and they had to have them. And they did such a good job of communicating on a daily and weekly basis um, and kept it fresh and kept it sincere. You know, it's 45 minutes away. I, I just felt like, you know, that's where he was going to end up. The only thing that, that always stuck in the back of my mind was Rocco wanted to play with an offensive line that he considered a brotherhood. And I'm telling you, early in the recruiting process, you know, I think Coach Quinn or someone got to him and talked about this brotherhood. 
And so as, as Rocco's conversations kind of always seemed to gear towards Michigan, there'd be, a, there'd be, there, he would make, he would make this comment about brotherhood. I was like, now his mother wasn't picking up on that, but I was, and I'm going, it's a little mixed message here. They don't talk about the brotherhood up there. I didn't see former players reaching out to him. I, I didn't get that same feel from the current offensive line, you know, a, as you did with the Notre Dame offensive line. And, and so everything kind of geared towards Michigan because they did such a great job. But the only thing that was stuck in the back of my mind here was that brotherhood thing. And at the end, I think it was the brotherhood thing that really separated the two programs. So you talk about being 45 minutes up the road. You're in Wolverine country, to say the least. How much does he or you guys get razzled for uh, for going out of uh, what I'm sure is a popular choice for folks at his school? I mean, his team wears a, a helmet that looks like Michigan, right? So what's yes. what have the first couple of months been been like when now that things have been settled? This is what everybody needs to understand about Rocco. He is he is no doubt a very good football player but he is even a way better young man. And he does things the right way, the sincere way. He's a good, good kid. I mean, he really is, you know, and um, understanding why Rocco came back, okay, to, to Michigan and Clarkston to play his senior year. He was offered to go to IMG his junior year. We turned that down. And then when Michigan – you know, kind of started to shut the high school season down. We, you know, apply, you know, I started to fill out the app. Those type of things to go back to, and they're like, we will. And then, you know, Rocco had this sincere conversation with his coach, said, I'm going to roll the dice. These are the reasons why I want to come back. I want to come back, you know, for, for my team. I want to come back for, for everybody that supported me. I want to come back for the town of Clarkston. I want to come back for Michigan in itself, to play in Michigan. And I think people who know him and understand this, they, they might, for one moment in time, put away their, their selfishness in, in, in their loyalty to the university to understand, you know, a, a really great young man chose a great, great university, regardless of how – you may feel personally about them as it pertains to the athletic portion of it. So we haven't had much backlash at all. So I want to end with, uh, with one more question going back to your playing days here, Mark, and either for, for folks who were old enough to have watched uh, you guys play would appreciate this or for Mike and myself who were too young for him. Tell us about playing with Barry Sanders. Unfreaking believable. Let me tell you, I was so into the game, right? I, I played the game like a like a man possessed, right? I mean, I had bad intentions on every single play. But we would we would come off the field and just watch Barry Sanders, right? Because the show he was gonna be able to put on was almost a was like a therapy from what you were you were going through on the defensive side. He was incredible, amazing. To see him on television was probably something special to see him you know in person was something even more special but to be on the sideline and be his teammate and understand how balanced he was and grounded he was you know from a from a personality standpoint is is unbelievable it's something you'll never forget etched in your memory forever some of those runs and moves i mean just I mean, just incredible. He's a great, he's a great guy too. I mean, he's not, trust me, the, I, I don't have in a certain way the appreciation for the modern day superstar as I did, you know, as a Barry Sanders. He was just a throwback, acted like guys, he, he wouldn't do good in today's standard, right? I mean, people, it's about a show. Barry's like, look, I, I'm just going to act like I've been there a thousand times before and I'm coming back a thousand more. Did it almost feel counterproductive to to tackle him in, in a sense, just because of how incredible he was to watch or you, you, every tackle came with a, you know, the everything in the back of your mind of, Oh, what if he goes down awkwardly or whatever? 
Yeah, he never took a big hit, guys. That that's that that's one thing. If you watch Barry, I mean, he was so elusive and so explosive. The reason why he was able to do the things he was able to do was he wasn't hit that often. Very rare. I mean, I, you want to talk about a moving target, folks? Let me tell you something. He was a moving target. He was fantastic. Well, Mark, we really appreciate you uh, joining us here and, and giving us a lot of neat and, and unheard insight into to Rockers recruitment that I'm sure uh, I, I appreciate it. I look forward to uh, hopefully being able to do this, you know, with you guys as often as you need something pretty good. Look at I like don't, it. Don't say it. that. We'll have you on as we'll have you on as a co-host if you say that, Mark. I, I, we'll put I, you I, in I, the I, intro I, bump for this thing. I won't have a problem, but I look at I did radio and television for seven years, guys, and sometimes you know, I, I'm really critical and I, I say what I see. And uh, sometimes some people aren't big enough to be able to handle that. So be careful what you watch for. Ask for it, you just might get it. Well, we'll have you on in like three years and maybe Notre Dame will lose a game and, and Rocco missed a big block. So we'll, we'll have you on there to criticize your boy. They lose one game in three years, folks. We'll all be happy campers. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right. Go Irish. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Take, Take care. You. Mike, how much fun was that with with Mark? I mean, all, all the, the stories, one, about uh, Rocco's process and, and how he delivered the news. But, yeah, I, I would think there's few things that would be more just a pure football experience and playing with Barry Sanders. Yeah, Patrick, we've been texting about getting Mark Spindler on the show for weeks. And I was like, dude, you, you're going to love it. And uh, I think about 20% of the entire – interview there me and you were just cracking up laughing so that was awesome oh yeah it would, hopefully certainly not the last time we'll uh we'll bring mark back on here but one more item to touch on here before we get out some less great news in, in notre dame recruiting in the last week uh, philip riley the four-star corner from the tampa bay area or at least played high school there from i believe originally the west coast yep seattle he backed out of his notre dame pledge on september 25th and my reaction here was, I know last time we talked about that Thuran Johnson, the Northwestern commit from Indianapolis that Notre Dame offered, uh, I don't know if it was late August or early September, but sometime recently, was a potential either or uh, with, or both with uh, Titus Mikhail Altamalala, the four-star athlete from Hawaii. But now I think it's kind of clear, maybe he's more of an option to replace Riley, uh, Mike, how, how are you seeing, one, where that figures into it, and two, what uh, kind of led to in, in the follow here from Riley decommitting? I think they would have offered Johnson whether or not Riley was stuck in the class. That's my personal opinion, um, not source or anything like that. But reading the tea leaves, um, uh, the offer to Johnson went out um, September 15th. And I don't think Riley had given any indication to Notre Dame at that point that he was wavering in his commitments. That's why I say, um, say that I, I don't think that um, Johnson's offer was because of Riley. They, they were really impressed with Johnson's um, senior film that he's put out. I mean, Indiana's already like halfway through the football season because they started August 21st. So he's, he had a really strong run. Um, he is, uh, Theron Johnson's offered, and this is Theron Johnson, Indianapolis North Central player. He's committed to Northwestern. Patrick's alma mater. There you go. There's another podcast we mentioned, both Northwestern and USF. How often does that get to happen? Um, so, yeah, Johnson, slot receiver or corner, or, or heck, maybe even safety. Notre Dame just lo loves him as an athlete and wants him in the class. As far as Riley's decommitment, Patrick, I went on a, kind of that rant earlier in the show. It's like, you know, school's like, oh, I didn't want them anyways, right? You know, when they don't get a kid. So I don't want to come on here and be like, hey, when Notre Dame got real Briley, it was great. That's probably what I said in the May podcast we did when he committed. Well, now that he's decommitted, I don't want to say, oh, Notre Dame, you know, he wasn't that good anyways, right? Because I would <laughs> look like a hypocrite. Um, but – I, so I went out to see Riley. This has been a crazy few weeks. So I keep seeing these kids and then news happens. I went and saw Riley September 11th. That was a big game down in the Tampa Bay area. Um, and I went in thinking this is the best corner in the class. Lockdown kid. Um, so excited to see him. 
he had a good game considering he had the 53-yard go-ahead kickoff return touchdown. But up to that point, you know, he got beat a couple times at, as, at his corner spot, kind of looking into the backfield, um, you know, uh, missed a couple tackles. So I, I left there thinking, I don't know if this kid is a corner. I was even thinking, man, he looked huge. Six, six, he look, I mean, he's listed at six foot, 190 pounds. I was thinking this kid might be 205 pounds, 210 pounds. He looked thick, um, built really well. So I left there thinking this kid's a safety or a rover. And you can watch my YouTube video on that game. And I mentioned that, that, you know, Notre Dame had been recruiting him as a corner, certainly. But I, my own eyes told me I don't think that kid could play corner. He didn't look that great in one on one coverage. Uh, but he certainly looks the part, and he had some nice tackles, and he showed off the athleticism on that kickoff return touchdown. So I thought, you know, this kid could be a really good safety. So to answer, like, what, what's the impact here? What, what's the sting of Notre Dame losing this commitment? On the cornerback side of things, I, I, I just did not left, – I left there thinking after I saw him play for three hours, did not think he was a cornerback in college. But I did leave there thinking this kid's a really good football player. So, again, he's a really good player. So Notre Dame loses that, and that stinks. Notre Dame was going to find a home for him somewhere. But as far as, you know, Notre Dame's future cornerbacks, I think you're just fine. I think Trance Tucker coming in is that fluid corner who is going to be really good at that position for the Irish. Yeah, that's that's how I look at it too. Where, and and I'll trust your in person evaluation over my throwing on a huddle tape and you know, whenever he committed and, and whatnot. It's Notre Dame's defensive habit is recruit really good football players and figure out where they're they're going to play. And no matter what we thought initially of this, he's a pure corner or whatever, or all right, he's a bigger kid who's a safety. It's he can play. And and that's a loss, and and, yep. and you you wouldn't have wanted to have that if you're if you're Notre Dame, I'm sure. Right. Even if Notre Dame watched the same game you did or saw the same film a month later or whatever, and concluded, all right, he's a different position that they can they can use this kid. I mean, he's a big kid out here who passes the physical eye test and is running back kicks. I mean, it's not that means he's not slow, right? And if you're talking about getting beat and by because you're peeking in the backfield or whatever. It's a, like a coaching thing that is that can be ironed out, and, and it's not like where you're seeing a lack of tools and, and whatnot. I'm, I'm sure when he returned that kickoff, it wasn't a the situation. Sh- the where short was area slow. quickness, the yeah, short exactly. area quickness, is my concern. But there's still a lot of of good traits here, and yeah, maybe that doesn't show up as a, a pure cover corner, but a a good player who can play at Notre Dame's level. I mean, you just saw him commit to USC. That's, that's where he's going, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and so he'll have a taste of Notre Dame fans. Won't see the last of him seemingly if he ends up seeing the field for USC in his time there. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a loss. And yeah. you oh, yeah. don't want to sound like it's there. We don't want to sound like, Oh, whatever. And like you said, the, the we didn't want him anyway, uh, to, to get, to get back on here. But anyway, it, it's Notre Dame has a one, a plan, with uh, three and Johnson. And even though, like you said, someone who might've been in the class regardless and two, a defensive back class that's still in pretty good shape with chance Tucker as the pure cover guy, Justin Walters as the, obviously that kid's a safety Ryan Barnes as a good football player can play either one, put them wherever you want to go. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I love Ryan Barnes. I, I, I wrote after Riley D committed, like, look, this, this DB class is still intact. Um, you know, Ryan Barnes is a, is a, and a lot of people don't really love the, when a kid like Barnes doesn't have this, like a set position. I love it. I, I love it. And, and that's how Notre Dame recruits. Um, like let's, let's just get the best football players in. So Barnes is very much a corner or he's very much a defensive back or a safety. Like he could do either one of those at a high level and seeing some recent clips of him working out short area quickness looks pretty good for Ryan Barnes. All right, let's get out of here, Mike. 
So, who are you going to see this Friday, if anything, or is it all Jaden Thomas? This Friday is Kane Barong going out to Northeast Georgia. So, um, this fall so far, I haven't had to take any flights. I've just been all drives to see recruits. But October 9th, you have Joey Tonona versus Blake Fisher. Yeah, I will be at that game in Indianapolis. Looking forward to it. It's where the ju- it's the juice. That's yeah, I had quite a an interesting game there where you see two of Notre Dame's offensive linemen of the future. All right, that'll do it for this edition of Pod Like a Champion. Again, please make rate, review, subscribe, leave us nice comments if you like what you hear. Follow us on Twitter at rivals underscore singer at Patrick Engel underscore. We will talk to you in a couple of weeks. Till then. Take care.